morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, May 16, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The U.S. imposes visa restrictions on more Nigerians for undermining 2023 election cycle as the opposition demands cameras in a courtroom that is hearing election petitions. The essence of this is to foreclose any post decisions, allegations that will affect the trial or that will affect the judgment of the trial in the public space. Meanwhile, Nigerian police investigate 15 killings amid violence between farmers and herders. Senegal's opposition leader plans to boycott a summons to appear in court today, Tuesday. An Ethiopian radio show on rural women comes under criticism for excluding men. And Kenya's president fires a permanent secretary for alleged corruption. He is sending a clear message to partners, global partners, international funders, that no donor money, no taxpayer money will be used in a wasteful manner and no act of corruption will be condoned in this government. And 23 people are missing after a hippo causes a canoe to capsize in Malawi. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Washington has imposed entry restrictions on more Nigerians for undermining the democratic process during the 2023 election cycle. Additional details were not provided. Reuters news agency says the action is the latest in a series of visa restrictions imposed on Nigerians in recent years. Court records show that Nigeria's election tribunal this month was to begin hearing opposition petitions challenging President-elect Bola Tinubu's victory in the disputed February presidential election. Tinubu, from the ruling All Progressive Congress Party, defeated his closest rivals, Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party and the Labour Party's Peter Obi, who have alleged fraud and launched a court challenge. Nigerian government officials told VOA on Monday that they had no reaction because the U.S. visa restrictions did not identify any specific individuals. In Nigeria, the opposition Labour Party and its presidential candidate Peter Obi filed a petition demanding live media broadcast of the ongoing election tribunal where judges are hearing the dispute over the outcome of the February 25 presidential vote. It comes after the main opposition, the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, also petitioned the court seeking for broadcast of its proceedings. Both presidential candidates, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar from the PDP and former Anam State Governor Peter Obe are challenging the outcome of the presidential contest, citing voter irregularities and rigging. Viewers Peter Colotti spoke with Kola Olobodinya, spokesperson for the campaign team of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. Well, the petition of the PDP to the uh, presidential election petition tribunal is just a, de- is a demand that the activities of the court should be done before the public by allowing media practitioners to cover the events at the tribunal. And the essence of this is to foreclose any post decisions, allegations that will affect the trial or that will affect the judgment of the trial in the public space. Bakola, wouldn't this be distracting a rather serious national security issue? No, I don't see that as a, as a possibility of creating issues bordering around national security. I do not see that. Where election was held, decision was reached by the Electoral Commission. The opposing parties have the opinion, and they hold to their opinions tenaciously that the election was full of malpractices, and that they can prove this at the tribunal. All the statutes of law of our country allow for that process. So how does that amount to harassing or impugning on the national security. I do not see that. Except there are things I don't want to hide or does not want the public to know. That's one of the times that we can be hiding, they can be hiding under the issue of national security. Otherwise, there is nothing and absolutely nothing wrong with conducting the affairs of the election tribunal in public. Some people are saying if the election tribunal is broadcast, it will put the judges in danger and that if their ruling does not necessarily go in favor uh, of some people, they could be targeted. 
such request has never been granted in Nigeria's history. So why should it be granted now, they say. How do you respond to that? Those are alibi to allow for plots that will not favor the process of trial. And I say that in a firm belief that if it's the law justices that are complaining or that are from that particular opinion, is understandable. But when politicians are the ones forming that kind of opinion, it shows that they are trying at every possible means to cover the atrocities that happen in the election. Otherwise, the belief of every Nigerian today is that the judges who, or the justices, the law justices, who come with a clean mind and with the intention to pursue only the cause of justice in the matter. And if that be the situation, all the alibis, all these issues that are being fought, that have been created will go to no issue, as even the lawyers will say. Kola Olobondeya is the spokesperson for the campaign team of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar of Nigeria. He was speaking with viewers Peter Clotty. Police in central Nigeria are investigating the killing last week of at least 15 people in a farming community that was attacked by gunmen. Police in central Nasarawa state said the killings appear to be in retaliation for the death of an ethnic Fulani herder who was attacked with a machete. Tensions between the farmer and herder communities over land use often explode into violence, as Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. Nasarawa State Police spokesman Ramhan Nanso said authorities have deployed joint security forces, including police, counterterrorism units, and the military to the affected area. He said it was unusual to have communal clashes between farmers and herders in that area and that authorities are engaging the herders and farmers in peace talks while the probe is underway. The attackers invaded the Takalafia and Kwanja villages in Karu district late Thursday and rained terror on villagers for hours, according to local residents. Police said it was a reprisal attack after an 18-year-old herdsman was killed with a machete blow to his head in the same area two days earlier. Nansal spoke to VOA by phone. In that axis, we are experiencing this for the first time, so it's kind of strange. We have activated stakeholders' engagement and interface. We've called for meetings between the farmers and herders across the states and some selected local governments where we normally experience these challenges. Locals told Nigerian media that at least 38 people were killed, including a pastor. They say the victims, including women and children, were given a mass burial Saturday. Nansal said police can only account for 15 deaths. I work with facts, I work with figures, I work with what I see, not what I hear. Farmer herder conflicts over resources like water, land, and pasture are one of many security challenges troubling Africa's most populous nation. In 2018, Amnesty International said nearly 4,000 people had been killed in bloody clashes over a three-year period. The group said the government's failure to investigate the problem was escalating the crisis. Authorities have sent condolences to affected families promised to punish perpetrators and help supply relief materials to residents whose houses were burned. Security analyst Mike Jaffa says the government must change its approach to achieve better results. By the time this government came in, you know, we had this crazy concentrated in the, in the northeast, you know, by activities of Boko Haram. But somewhere along the line, when the government uh, turned the heat on the Boko Haram in the northeast, they started spreading towards the north central, northwest, incoming government to change the approach since we have not yielded much uh, uh, results. Nigerian leader Mohamed Buhari will be stepping down this month for successor Bola Tinubu. President elect Tinubu inherits a country still battling Islamist militants in the northeast and kidnapped for ransom gangs known as bandits in the northwest and central regions. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. The trial of Senegal opposition leader Usman Sanko for alleged rape is supposed to get underway today, Tuesday, in Dakar. 
Meanwhile, Sonko has appealed his conviction in March this year. He was convicted and given a two-month suspended sentence in the libel case brought against him by the country's tourism minister. Sonko was ordered to pay about $332,000 after he was found to have falsely accused the tourism minister of embezzling. Mamandu Lamin Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He tells me that Sonko has decided to disobey the court citation because the charges are a politically motivated effort by President Macky Sall's government to prevent Sonko from contesting the 2024 presidential election. This is uh, about uh, the trial against the minister Mambay Nyam. That one, Sonko has been condemned for six months and 200 million CFA francs, which is around $400,000. He should pay it to minister Mambay Nyam. And what he has done with his lawyers is just to go now to the Supreme Court to try to get an, another judgment. That's what's happening for the time being. However, uh, what he is now on stake is that normally tomorrow we'll start a new trial against Usman Sonko against. That one is a crime because they're accusing him of raping and threatening with violence that lady. And that, that trial will start tomorrow morning, normally. Why does he feel the need to get a second opinion? Well, I mean, that, that's something normal. I mean, he had the first judgment, which is against him, and then he went now to the second judgment, and now uh, he, he will go to the Supreme Court. I mean, there is nothing extraordinary uh, about that. It's something that people usually do here. We go to the end of the justice system of Senegal. You talk about the appearance in court on Tuesday. This, you say, is about the rape case. Uh, did I hear that his supporters were protesting? Yes, of course. That one is probably more serious in terms of charge because it's a crime. So uh, Sonko has said last week that he would start some kind to disobey to the justice system because he always said that that was a plot coming from President Macky Sall and his regime he will not accept the justice in that condition. And he said that he will start to disobey to the justice system. And uh, I think that's what they start. And uh, this morning we have protests in some cities like uh, Zigenshaw, which is the mayor of Zigenshaw in South Senegal. In some part of Dakar, there are protests uh, coming in. So what is going to happen on Tuesday when he goes to court, when the trial starts? I don't think that Sonko will go to court unless the government force him to do that. I don't think that he will go. From what he have said, he will not go because he said that he will disobey. And now we'll see what will happen tomorrow morning. If the government or the justice system or the, the defense force will be able to catch him and bring him by force in the court. To what degree uh, are all these related to what's happening about the election coming up? Of course, uh, all these things are related to the facts, the simple facts that Macky Sall, after two mandates, want to run for the third mandate. All the problems of Senegal are coming from this idea. Uh, I don't know where Macky Sall has, has got that idea because he was here in 2011 with me and other people. We were saying that President Abdullah Wad did not have the right to have a second term, uh, he did not have to run for the second term. We were together, and it was quite clear for everybody in the political class of Senegal that no one in Senegal uh, has the right to run for the third term. And then uh, Macky Sall has a chance to become president in 2012, and he has the first mandate until 2019, and now he's in the second term which will finish in 2024. That's finished for him. And he wants to run for the third term. That's why he's organizing all this system, which may destabilize the political system and even the society of Senegal. Mamadou Lamin Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He was speaking with us from the Senegalese capital, Dakar. Kenyan President William Ruto has dismissed his Public Health Permanent Secretary, Dr. Joseph Mburu, for mishandling the tender for the supply of mosquito nets. The president also suspended Kenya Medical Supplies Authority CEO Terry Ramadani for the same alleged scandal. Joseph Kyoko is a Kenyan political analyst. He tells me that the dismissals indicate that President Ruto wants to send a message that corruption will not be tolerated in his government. It was a scandal involving uh, the Global Fund for HIV AIDS, supply of mosquito nets that 
that uh, are repellent to malaria. It's more of a preventive mosquito nets that are normally supplied in areas that are prone to malaria. And the tender was mishandled. A company with no capacity to supply was given, and they skipped a manufacturer of that company. Now, ordinarily, due diligence should have been made. But even without going further into the details of the scandal itself, as it was exposed by one of the dailies in Kenya, is the fact that the president has uh, shown that um, he's serious about the fight of corruption in his government, that he did not take time. He has uh, news was broken. I think he got facts. He decided that he does not want uh, his administration to be mad with the corruption allegations. And therefore, he fired not only a PS that he had appointed less than eight months ago, but, but also the membership of the board of the parastato that is concerned with the acquisition and procurement of those nets. That, that's a very bold statement. What does this mean now uh, for future global fund lending to Kenya. Once the nature of this scandal was discovered and that the president showed that there are no sacred cows in his government, he is sending a clear message to partners, global partners, international funders, that no donor money, no taxpayer money will be used in a wasteful manner and no act of corruption will be condoned in his government. There are no sacred cows in his government. It is very easy to have assumed that uh, these people that were appointed or were serving those positions were very close allies of the president because it's a new administration. It's not even one year old. They've not even read their first budget. So the action taken is more a statement of intent to show donor community that this government is serious about the fight against corruption and that any person who plays with the taxpayers' money, with the donor funds, will be dealt with accordingly. Can we say that uh, these are just uh, allegations, and if that is the case, will these people, including the permanent secretary, will they be able to get their day in court? Of course, they're entitled to their day in court. Uh, I mean, uh, our constitution is clear that everybody is innocent until proven guilty. But, but you see, the fight about corruption is majorly a perceptional fight. Even as you win the real fight, it's perception. Corruption is, is more perceptional. So you, you certain actions must be taken in order to deal with the perception of corruption. So now, if that permanent secretary was still in the office, then what happens to the approaches of resolving this issue? I think the best thing the president has said, since you are my appointee, uh, you stay outside. If the process establishes that you have no role, I can still appoint you in another position. It is an action of fighting corruption, both perceptionally and also in the real sense of it. Joseph Kiyoko, a Kenyan political analyst, was speaking with us from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Ethiopian journalist Mel Kansu Solomon broadcast the radio program Yemeshi, which focuses on rural women in Ethiopia. The show has received criticism for not being inclusive, mostly from men. Mel Kansu defends the show, saying women's voices need to be heard in the media. Miami Seeker spoke to her and files this report from Addis Ababa. For some listeners, Ethiopian journalist Melkamso Salamon's weekly show is too niche, too narrowly focused. Her show, Yemechish, an Amharic slang term that roughly translates to, you go girl, features the lives of rural or Ethiopian women. We get told, you keep talking about women all the time. What about men's issues? Is it only women who have problems in this country? They say that we have a lot of other societal problems. Some people say it's luxury to talk about this. Yemechish, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has been running for the past four years, highlighting issues that can improve the lives of women in areas of health and education. Most women, like men in Ethiopia, live in rural areas and making space for their voices is important, says Melkamso. We get the stories of these women to be heard. We show how hard their life is, how they don't have any help, how far they go to fetch water, how much they carry by themselves at the market. They don't have any help. We also do stories on what they could accomplish if they use this time working on something that can earn them money. People have that aha moment when they hear these stories, she says. 
Yimashish has received positive feedback coming from male audience members amidst the pushback. Bethlehem Nagash, a member of the Ethiopian Media Women's Association, says that giving women a voice in the media has the potential to address widespread gender equality, but notes that women traditionally don't have that voice in Ethiopia. Mostly women are subjects of the media uh, as victims and, you know, uh, passive uh, voices rather than active ones who are, you know, who can contribute to the, uh, the society. According to a 2021 research report that Bethlehem co-authored, only 30% of the journalists employed by seven major media houses were women. Bethlehem says media houses which offer a better work-life balance for women through providing daycare and improved maternity have been successful in growing women's participation. I think maybe what we take from that is uh, for us to advocate for you know, more uh, balanced uh, and female-friendly uh, newsroom and also uh, media uh, operations. So uh, maybe we need to appreciate some of the work done by a few uh, media houses and also uh, try to uh, advocate you know, uh, for other media houses to replicate that as well. Yimachish airs weekly on Shagga Radio in Ethiopia, whose owner, a veteran woman journalist, has supported the show in content production. She has advised me based on her own professional experience on who to speak to for the show and then help make those connections happen. She has helped me meet a lot of distinguished women. Shows like Yimachish are not common in Ethiopia. The media expert Bethlehem says including women's perspective in media can be used to counter the same narrative that it is guilty of echoing. Maya Masakar for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. A one-year-old boy is dead and more than 20 people are missing in southern Malawi after a canoe carrying 37 people flipped when it was hit by a charging hippo. Police say 13 people managed to swim to the shore of the Untayamoyo River, which in the Chichewa language means a place where lives are lost. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. The police spokesperson in Malawi's Sanje district said the incident happened 7 a.m. Monday when 37 people were crossing the river on a large canoe to work in their gardens. Police sub-inspector Agnes Zalakoma, speaking to VOA via WhatsApp, said the death toll is expected to rise as police detectives and rescue teams search for missing people. The canoe accident is the third deadly incident on the river in three years. Gladys Ganda is the lawmaker for the area. The Amoyo means death trap. You cross that river at your own risk because it's infested with crocodiles, it's infested with hippos, and the canoes that are operating around that area, they're not the motorboats. So when you're crossing that, you actually know that I'm doing this at, at my own risk. I've done it before, and it's very dangerous to do that. Ganda said the accidents could be avoided by constructing a bridge across the river. The bridge has to be has to be constructed, and probably other bridges also that will take us in, into into the, the, the fields. But the bridge is is a must. It's not a luxury in, in, anymore. That that is a necessity. It has to reduce the deaths that are happening around uh, this area. In the meantime, locals have asked to have some of the animals removed from the area. Ganda says a rising hippo population in particular is posing a food insecurity threat as the animals are also destroying crops. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. And that's it for this Tuesday, May 16th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for spending your morning with us. For more.